from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 47, recorded on August 2nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, good to see you all again. Seems, nice summer. seems like forever ago. The summer is ripping by, isn't it? We're in it August. Is. It <sighs> really is. Also joining us from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Great to be here. Good to see all your faces. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here and it's great to see you guys. <laughs> Back together again. North, immune is an East Coast thing, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. <laughs> We're all in the same time zone. That makes we it need better. To, <laughs> that does make it easier. easier. But we can, we can invite some West Coast people so we're not, oh, you know, being too biased. Everybody well? Everybody okay? I know Brienne is well. I just saw her on Friday, but... Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm in fact much better because my office where I was on Friday is very cold. And so today I can like feel my arms. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Okay>. good. <laughs> um, so let's give a, like a quick one to two sentence update of like this point in the summer. What are you looking forward to? Oh, I had as all your, my as fun your next. Already. Did you have your fun? Okay, but yeah, you looking yeah. forward to classes? We on a road trip. Is that? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, we're supposed to be in person this year. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Okay. Some yeah. testing involved in that plan, I would hope. Uh, what do you mean? Like, uh, like yeah. um, oh, oh, you mean testing? COVID, COVID, COVID testing? Yes. I'm yes. thinking. Well, are we going to give them tests? Of course, we're going to test. Like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, of course, we're also okay. going to test COVID, yeah. <laughs> test yeah. good. Yeah, we're, we're back on mass mandate again. Are you requiring vaccinations like Duke is? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. We, we're we are. about 90% faculty um, already uptake, um, and I think it's like 85% or 89% for all faculty and staff and students okay. currently. Yeah, we are That's also good. requiring vaccination fall, in the fall classes or in person. Yep. Um, I'm looking forward to the pandemic ending so we can save lives, that? But, but also Vincent, move when's on. that happening? <laughs> Crystal ball. Do you so have a, a if date you asked that? me <laughs> in, in the beginning of the summer, I would have said the fall because in the U S anyway, because I assumed 80% of the people would be vaccinated, but wow, are we far off from that? And I think that's, uh, it's going to extend it. I don't know, maybe next year, early next year, maybe never because people, so many people don't want to be vaccinated. So. Yeah, it also depends on if you mean end of a pandemic here or end of the pandemic everywhere. Yeah, of course, of course yeah, there are many sure. countries sure. that have hardly vaccinated anyone, right? Right, right. But some countries have done very well. It turns out that India has vaccinated 450 million people, which uh, is not even half their population, but there are yeah, but still, more people than the U.S. I mean, for a shorter, in a shorter amount of time. Yeah, too. I was right. on a call last week with Columbia Health has global centers around world. They have one in Mumbai. So I did a call and the lady who was talking to me said, here in India, we have no problem with getting vaccinated. It was like a dig at the US. Wow. Sure, sure. Well, we just have a lot more science communication to do. We do. Working exactly. on it, right? Yeah. Working on it. Yes. We're all out there. How, the how about you, Steph? What are you looking forward to? Well, I'm in the middle of a manuscript, manuscript writing uh, fever. I have a bunch to get out. So I'm just looking forward to getting those in and starting some new projects in the fall. So a lot of culminating to, you know, it's so, it's funny how publishing works because I feel like I've been presenting this work. I presented at ASV, which was exciting. And, but by the time you get the paper published, I mean, I haven't even submitted and then it's going to be like six more months. So it does, it's a little anticlimactic, you know? Yeah, that's very, very true. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. So what about you, Brian? What do you well, look forward to? I had a fabulous summer with my summer research students. Um, oh. And now that sort of summer research program is done and I'm prepping classes and getting ready for the fall. But when the fall comes around, those students are going to come back and we're going to get to pick those projects back up and keep going. Oh, so fun. I'm really looking forward to that. Awesome. That's great. And how about you, Vincent? Yeah. What am I looking forward to? Well, I was telling Brianne before we came on that... Uh, we're opening a studio in Manhattan for all the pods and other things. It's going to be called the incubator. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And we, Is it going to be 5% CO2? 5% CO2. <laughs> 37 C. Very humid. 37 C. Yeah, it's kind of humid. Yeah. Um, 
it is uh, a office slash studio that uh, we've leased. Me and uh, Daniel Griffin. Um, so his company is a nonprofit, Parasites Without Borders, and and Microbe TV. I filed for nonprofit status so we can uh, have tax deductible contributions to support our work in communicating science. And I want to expand what we do. The good, good part is, is in central Manhattan. It's two blocks from Penn Station, so it's a central location for travelers. And for me, I take a train and I walk two blocks. So I no longer am driving now. I've had it with <clears> – <throat> how many years have I been driving? Since 1989, <laughs> I've been driving 72 like miles done. a day. I got to tell you, I just – driving is crazy. People are out of control. They don't know mm -hmm. how to drive. It's because I'm getting old, you know, but also <laughs> I'm too tired and I fall asleep a lot. So I figured I got to stop before I have a problem. So I, I can fall asleep on the train. My wife says, you're going to end up in South Jersey and, and <laughs> it's fine. It's better than <laughs> hurting myself. <laughs> um, I've, I've missed stops before on the train, but I've gotten used to the train now. I really like it. So I'm, I'm going to go take the train every day, go to the, the incubator, make content of all kinds, record all the pods there, and hopefully hire people to help uh, make some creative process. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Great. Excited about that. F uh, career number two. <laughs> yes, yes. Excited for you. Yes. That'd be great. It sounds so fun. All right, today, and, uh, and of course, everyone's welcome, and uh, we will have an opening party, but if anyone in New York, please come by, and we can do a, a chat record it and release it and teach the world about science of all kinds. Really looking forward to it. Today we have a paper and I'm really excited to, to uh, present it. I haven't done a paper on immune for decades. Well, <laughs> <laughs> long time. It um, has been a while. But this happened to be one that caught my eye and it involves some viruses. Got a little bit for everyone. In this and uh, yes, I, have a, I have three individuals who know the immunology so they can <laughs> fix all the mistakes I make. So this is a paper published in PNAS. IgA potentiates netosis in response to viral infection. This is first author, Hannah Stacy, last author, Matthew Miller. And there's someone here I must, I have met or in some, Caitlin Malarkey. I know that hmm. name. Hmm. Um, anyway, this is from... Um, Variety of places in Canada, McMaster University, Western University in on London, Ontario, which was the site of an ASV. I don't know if any of you went to that one. No. Not that one. No. Uh, that's the year I was president of uh, oh, ASV. Cool. And the first session, on the first day, the power went out in the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're, it's a nightmare. <laughs> in the first talk. So I think... It was Britt Glounsinger from um, Berkeley, right? The power went out and the guy said, wait, we're, we're working on it. And, and she put a little light on the podium and she said, I will now do an interpretive dance of my findings. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> fantastic. Because she's, she likes to dance. Anyway, <laughs> um, look who edited this paper. I see that. Max I do. Cooper. Yes. Max Cooper, Emory University, still going strong. All right, so this is about IgA and nets, um, which are made by neutrophils and viruses. So IgA, um, which is your favorite antibody, right, Steph? Is that correct? That is. If I had to choose a favorite, IgA is my favorite antibody. We produce the most amount of IgA in our bodies in regards to quantity. And it has, it's, it's, it's sometimes overlooked. And so maybe that's why I'm always, you know, rooting for it. So IgA uh, can be found in mucosal surfaces as well as elsewhere. It can it can neutralize virus infection, but it can also do things via the FC portion, as we'll see here. And um, yeah, uh, and we might mention that IgA is usually found in two forms. Yep. Um, dimeric IgA, um, where basically two copies of an antibody are joined together with a secretory component um, or monomeric IgA. And I will admit, um, <laughs> I'm sure to Steph's chagrin, that uh, typically I think a lot about um, secretory IgA, that dimeric IgA, and I often forget about the functions of monomeric IgA, um, which is in the serum. Right, right. Yes. So d d monomeric 
IgA circulating in your blood represents a smaller proportion compared to IgG. But in the mucosa, these plasma cells are secreting dimers, which happens to be the case because of this joining chain that's expressed in these cells. And then it, it, it's amazing because it, it can bind the, the bottom portion of our epithelial cells in the mucus and just flip it. And when it flips into our, our mucosal space, it, it retains the J chain with its receptor and becomes secretory IgA and it's protease resistant. So it can survive in these very you know acidic protease uh, laden areas of the body. It's just... Yeah, but you're right. There's a lot of monomeric IgA in serum that can drive pathogenesis. Do we know how much of the monomeric uh, actually gets out into the mucosa? Is it any? Because there is IgG (sighs) leak as well, right? That is a fascinating question because it's one that we've been working on to try to understand, you know, if we're going to be giving people monomeric or dimeric IgA as a therapy, Mm -hmm. we know it can come, it can, it can go from tissue to apical lumen, you know, my mouth, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mammary gland, breast milk. But if you put it into blood, can it, a large molecule like dimeric IgA transcise toast through endothelial cells? Because Hmm. IgG has this FCRN receptor that helps mm-hmm. retain the half-life because it's flipping it back into serum. So it's kind of unknown what I, how IgA is working in, in the vasculature. So in the discussion, they say that IgA in the serum is 82 to 624 milligrams per deciliter. And the distribution is tissues is about 4 to 16% of the plasma concentration, they say. And that's they, they say that because they they justify the concentrations they use in their experiments. Right. So this fact that it's joined blocks the FC and it can't do effector right. functions, right? right? Yeah, and maybe Vincent, um, for our listeners, describing just a little bit about the antibody molecule and what makes the FC portion or the the stem important. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, <laughs> antibody, I didn't want to dominate this conversation, no, but this can. is like Go such, an, such an exciting and, and an area that... Um, that I'm in. So, so the molecule, the antibody molecule, regardless of, you know, what isotype it is, it, there's the, the fab region and that's the region that binds the antigen. That's the reason re- region that's specific for its pathogen, its, its target. But th- just recently mm. an explosion <laughs> of, of research has, has been looking at the FC portion. So this is the, the stock, the, of the, why it's the thing that juts down and it. It, it can bind receptors on cells like um, monocytes, neutrophils, and, and induce things like phagocytosis, cellular cytotoxicity, and uh, netosis, which, you know, Vincent, I'll let you, um, or, or maybe Cindy or Brian explain more about netosis. It's a very unique function of neutrophils, but it has been associated particularly with um, the RV144 trial for an HIV vaccine with protection. And so for a long time, I don't think it was always the case that we thought about the FC region as a way to prevent or block infection or be a correlative vaccine protection. But now we're really looking at this molecule as both sides. How can you induce um, you know, effective antibodies that can both bind the pathogen and then cross-link mm-hmm. multiple to then um, harness the FC power, which would just uh, signal these really neat um, phagocytosis and and, and uh, cellular driven processes. Do you know what cells express the FC alpha receptor one? So when we talk about FC receptors, we're talking about receptors that will bind that constant region of whatever antibody. And they're alpha if they bind A, gamma if they bind G. So if we have IgA, the FC alpha receptors will bind to those. Do So neutrophils clearly express them, but what other cells could also um, respond to that FC part of this, the uh, monomeric IgA? Yes. Yeah, so neutrophils seem to be the dominating cell type, but eosinophils, um, mm-hmm. monocytes, and some macrophages. It's not mm-hmm. as many macro- macrophages, I think, are more likely to express the IgG specific, mm-hmm. the FC mm-hmm. gamma receptors, but Kupfer cells um, are specialized cells that do express FC alpha. So it's, it's um, there, the profile of, of, cells that express FC alpha are different than IgG, not entirely, but it seems to be, it's a, it's a different response than IgG, FC um, responses. So neutrophils- I'm glad you asked that. That was like my, a major question I had when I was reading right. this paper. Yep. Yeah. Now, neutrophils are the other player in this paper, if you've heard right. already about them. They have uh, an FC receptor uh, called FC alpha, uh, but they also do netosis, 
in, in addition to other things, and I'm going to let someone else explain that, but in addition, um, I, I love this sentence, the data on the protective versus the pathogenic role of neutrophils is nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> right. A very it's loaded sentence. Well, yeah, because the thing with neutrophils is they're they're really powerful, but they're also somewhat nonspecific, right? And so mm. when they discharge their antimicrobial mechanisms, they yeah. cause a lot of collateral damage. And nets are uh, one of those potential mechanisms. So I sort of think about nets. I think I think we've talked about this before as a Spider Man. Like it, it shoots out this net. Mm -hmm. So when the neutrophils get activated, they shoot out this net, and the nets are made of DNA, um, and they are have many different proteins associated with those DNA strands that can capture microbes and can also inactivate or kill microbes depending on what kind of molecules are present. Um, elastase is a major um, indicator of these nets, but yeah, they're kind of hard to capture because they're very fragile. So it's these little thin filaments of DNA. And so there's very precise ways that people... Um, put them onto slides and then activate them and they shoot out these little nets and then you have to preserve them to be able to see them. And they had really nice pictures in this particular paper. But I, I actually learned um, that I didn't know there was viable netosis. I knew about mm. regular netosis where it's uh, reactive oxygen dependent and then the cells vomit out their DNA and that's sort of their their end. You know, they they do this as a protective mechanism, but they also, it's basically suicide for them. But um, they're apparently um, earlier and by different mechanisms, they can shoot out some nets and still stay viable, which I think is pretty fascinating. Yeah. And so, so people should remember that neutrophils are generally very short-lived cells. Yeah. Um, and so it's not necessarily, you know, catastrophic that they're uh, doing this sort of suicide um, mechanism because they're normally short-lived cells. You make a whole bunch of them in the bone marrow. They are then released upon infection. Um, sometimes if you've ever gone to the doctor and had someone check your white count to see if your mm -hmm. white count is high, that really is that you have a lot of neutrophils um, right. that have been released from the bone marrow um, that are hoping to do something like netosis. Yeah, I sort of always call them the kamikaze pilots when I when I try <laughs> and assign different roles to, to different cells. These are the ones that kind of storm in and like blow up everything and then are gone. So net neutrophil extracellular traps... And they were originally discovered um, as being antibacterial. They can right. ra wrap around bacteria and destroy them. And so the question is, what about viruses? And there's some evidence for some viruses that uh, you can that nets will actually uh, control infection. Um, and there's also evidence that they make disease worse for some viruses. Yeah. So that's what this paper is about. And they say here something that I didn't know, and you, you guys need to tell me. They say almost nothing is known about the contribution of IgA-mediated FC-dependent effector functions because mice don't have the FC-alpha receptor homologue. So I would like to draw everyone's attention <laughs> to an investigator um, named Marjolene Von Egmond, mm -hmm. and she's from out in the Netherlands, and she has dedicated her career to this exact topic. I was at a, um, a Keystone Symposium, and she gave a great talk about IgA-induced effector functions, particularly neutrophil-based, because they can really be detrimental in um, autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis. And so there's a paper she published in 2014, which it did not involve viruses. And so that's the unique aspect of this paper, but it defined IgA induced netosis. So I would draw people's attention to her work. I think overall, if we're looking at the field, it definitely is understudied, but you know, could, could have maybe cited her a little bit more if I, if I was the mm. reviewer of this paper, but definitely a lot needs to be learned. So, so in mice, staff. There's oh, no yes. FC alpha receptor home. Is there? That, that is correct. So, so what do mice do then? <laughs> So she actually was that Marjolene was the first one to engineer humanized FC alpha mm -hmm. receptor mouse. So correct, it, it, mice don't have this receptor. And they also have a lot of dimeric IgA in the blood, which is not true for humans. We have very little dimeric IgA. So, and, and mouse IgA, the, the, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in the, in the liver um, and in bile in mice. And so it, it's not, you're right, it's maybe not the best model, mm -hmm. but there are 
FC, humanized FC alpha receptor mice. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe they couldn't get those or maybe there's something with those mice, but it does make the field, it does make it a bit challenging. Okay. Mm -hmm. But mice, so in mice, there's no FC binding of IgA, monomeric IgA. Correct, correct. But, and they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. I think they probably utilize yeah. the FC gamma receptors for IgG to perform similar yeah, type functions. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. All right. So in this paper, they want to know um, about IgA mediated netosis and in, in the role in virus infection. Now, can we say something about neutrophils in virus infection, especially flu? Yes, so absolutely. What, what, Go ahead. How much of a role do they really play? Because we tend to think of it. Um, you know, as a epithelial infection and then a specific immune response coming in. I know there's some role, clearly, because there, there's a massive inflammatory component. Yeah, there's some role of, that they're involved in protection, but it also, they're, there's for sure pathologic. If you have yeah. lung yeah. influenza, you know, pneumonia, you get high inf neutrophil infiltration, right? And as you said before. And that's even in viral pneumonia, not necessarily yeah, bacteria, viral pneumonia, for sure. Pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so having a neutrophil infiltration in your lung is not good because they release lots of things that are toxic to cells. Yeah. Right. Well, and even, you know, <clears throat> at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, mm -hmm. wasn't there some information that having a high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio yes, right. um, was associated yes. with uh, pathology? Right. Gosh, right. I remember mm -hmm. that way in yep. the beginning, remember? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Daniel showed us his handmade graph of his patients, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Yeah. Yep. yep. All right, so in this paper, they use uh, a couple of viruses. The first one is influenza virus, where this is very interesting. So tip, historically, antibodies that block influenza virus infection, they bind to the head and they block interaction of the hemagglutinin of the influenza virus particle with sialic acid receptors, right? But, and, and on, on tomorrow's TWIV, we have a, a paper all about non-neutralizing but protective antibodies. They are okay, now cool. um, <laughs> really neat, broadly neutralizing influenza virus antibodies that can neutralize infection with a variety of different influenza virus isolates. And they don't bind the head, they bind the stalk. And they seem to not neutralize infection, but rather block infection by FC mediated functions, which is really cool. And the, so idea, cool. the idea is, so the antibody binds the stalk the FC binds, say, a neutrophil, and then the head of the hemagglutinin and bisalic acid. So you have this, this uh, assembly that you make, which is apparently really good for, for neutralizing instead of just the antibody binding the head and blocking attachment. All right, so they want to know. Go ahead. And, tar and it's interesting to, to be able to then generate, you know, for the body to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies that have this function. I, you know, it seems to be difficult because not everybody makes them. Yeah. And, and obviously that's why it's the, the target for the universal vaccine. But, but then is it, is it detrimental in some, some circumstances where you would, you know, autoimmune diseases is what I'm thinking of. Do you want that much FC engagement, even if it does block yeah. infection? Yeah. So it's, yeah. It could nuanced, be. right? What was that sentence? It's nuanced. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, broadly neutralizing antibodies against viruses in general are quite rare. Even the SARS-CoV-2 yeah. mm -hmm. ones are rare, right? They have to, they yep. find rare B cells that make them. So there's, right. uh, there's something about them that it must be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not just that they're highly um, somatically mutated. hyper mutated, right? Maybe there are other reasons too. So they, they in this study, they do netosis assays, which they get neutrophils from people, from blood, and they put them in culture. And then they stain for uh, a neutrophil elastase, a component of the net, um, as, a, as an assay. And they take pictures and they, then they measure it and make graphs of it. So first question is they, they take influenza virus and they add antibody, IgA. Um, and they should do it with IgG. And they say, do we see nets being made when we put this onto... Uh, the neutrophils. And um, they also have a drug that induces netosis, uh, PMA, which is a positive control. So you can see <laughs> that your assay works. 
So they find that the IgA complex with influenza virus stimulates higher levels of netosis than either antibody alone or virus alone. But IgG didn't do it. IgG influenza A virus, no netosis above background ratio. And then they increase the amount of IgA to virus. And actually, two to one is the best. If they go above it, it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, and it's really neat, the pictures. You can see little uh, nets. The, the, the little nets, yeah. the little strings, yep. right? Yeah. In, in the IgA yeah. plus influenza virus. Yep. Yeah, and I also really like, you know, they also are staining not only with the elastase, but for a DNA stain. Right. And so you can really see kind of that DNA also being a part of those nets. Now, right. the, the antibodies that they used in this experiment, it's important to tell you, uh, the IgA is monomeric IgA from, from blood of of uh, people who recovered from influenza virus. And the IgG is also from the peripheral blood. So it's all, it's polyclonal. Right. And they want to know if broadly neutralizing antibodies play any role in this um, netosis that they see. So they have some monoclonals which are broadly neutralizing that bind to the stalk. They have a monoclonal that binds the stalk and they have a monoclonal that binds the head domain of the hemagglutinin. And when they do their netosis assay with stalk binding antibody, you get induction of netosis, but not with antibodies that bind the head. That's crazy. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I just, I would never, have, I would never. And that's what well, they say. They think it's because when they bind the head, it's just the FC that can interact with the neutrophil, but if the stalk antibody binds, the FC hits the neutrophil and then the sialic acid, the HA head hits sialic acid, I don't know, maybe on another neutrophil and then that makes it more efficient. I don't know. It's a good so I, th I think it's, it, it, it seems to be, it's more stoichiometry or structure, so something physical ab about the, the, yeah, the length yeah. between these different things, it, maybe more than an inherent differences and I, I don't know the it could, I guess it could also be like your the the tightness of the binding to um do you think it's potentially the um degrees of freedom so if you're bound to the head group it's kind of flexible right but if you're bound to the stalk it's kind of s stiff I would think so if you, you if the you antibody to, couldn't rotate as many ways yeah it would yeah, hit the cell yeah. membrane Maybe, ways so yeah. therefore it's more likely to cause a cross-linking of the a yes. C receptor, very robust cross-linking yeah. on yeah. that. Sure. On that. But I guess yeah. what's interesting about that um, is it's not, if, if that were the case, then an IgG would Should maybe, work. yeah. I, I mean, well, it, unless, unless the, the FC gamma receptor doesn't cause netosis as efficiently at this as level, IgA right. Right. which I guess they do see. Yeah. So it, you're right. It must be specific to LC alpha and then maybe the, yeah, the rotation, structural how far rotation. is it structural? Yeah. Yeah. The, the yeah. IgGs, of course, do other things with neutrophils, right? Absolutely. And, and virus like antibody-dependent cytotoxicity and so forth, yeah. but not apparently netosis. Now, it would be interesting if you if you look at this figure and for people who are not looking at it, there are four dots, there are four data points, and one of them has no netosis. And so what's happening with that, with, with, with the IgA... Um, I'm sorry, that's the monoclonal. And so what specifically happened there with that? I mean, those are repeats. So are they different donors? Could it be yeah. a donor thing? Could be a donor. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Maybe you would want to repeat. Maybe they did repeat that and it was always zero. <laughs> I also want to know if IgA would interfere with uh, IgA stimulated netosis because as they say, you know, we have both in the blood. So. They, mix, they do mixing experiments and IgG, the presence of IgG doesn't make netosis stimulated by IgA any better or any worse. So it's IgA that does it on its own. Okay, so what about other viruses? <laughs> uh, is it just <laughs> influenza A virus? So they use a lentivirus <laughs> pseudotyped with SARS-CoV-2 spike. So. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be a paper published in 2021 <laughs> <laughs> if you Indeed. couldn't find SARS-CoV-2. Indeed. Um, so they incubate neutrophils with this lentivirus, um, and they actually get netosis when they use a lot of virus alone. 
mm-hmm. 0.2 mg per milliliter, which is a lot of virus. They will, they do get some netosis, but I think that's physiologically pff, not not happening, most likely. Right. Uh, but then they got IgA from convalescent serum, and they when they add that to the lantivirus, it then stimulates <clears throat> netosis at levels of virus that are much much lower and on their own would not stimulate netosis. Um, so it works with <laughs> lantiviruses with the SARS-CoV-2 spike. Um, they also looked at um, antibody HIV immune complexes. All right. So a third, well, the lentivirus is not really a, a real virus. It's a pseudovirus, right? <laughs> so this is their second. And they also see netosis with those antibodies. So based on this, they say this IgA-induced netosis likely happens in the context of many viral infections. I, mean, I think that's a big leap from two. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think you got you have to look more. Maybe that, I mean, these are both mucosal uh, viruses. They start in the mucosa. Maybe that makes a difference too. You know, I, I don't. What if you did poliovirus, which starts? In, yeah, uh, it's another. Well, mucosal I was thinking. One. No, but I was thinking. What about if they use a non-enveloped virus? And maybe a non-enveloped yeah. virus. Yeah. Yep. I was going to say. I. It's interesting because most pathogens it's difficult to think of one that doesn't have some mucosal route at some point, you know, unless it's delivered, HIV delivered through blood, through needles or something, you know, um, West Nile. Yeah, West yeah, Nile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Arthropod. Yeah. So arthropod they should born, do, yeah. yep. They should do arthropod yeah. born. Flavy mm-hmm. viruses. Yeah. Flavies. Yeah. I think that, so don't you think it's a bit much to say it happens with many viral? Well, viruses? they did it with one virus and two pseudotypes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I just think it's not enough. Yeah, but yeah. The, the reviewers let them get away with it. Fine. Yeah, maybe a couple more. We would have been happy, okay, with the word many. I think the mosquito born <laughs> would be great. That's a good idea. That would be really good, yeah. right? Because it, it, I would, I guess, venture to say that because they're only looking at monomeric IgA, and we'll learn a little bit about secretory IgA. I don't think being a mucosal pathogen. Well, that's why I asked originally mm-hmm. what cells express and what yeah. role neutrophils play, because you need mm-hmm. to know that the players that are doing this are in the right place at the right time. And it seems seems like they are. Yeah. So even if you have a mucosal virus, you're still going to have these cells. But then my original question to you was how much of the monomeric actually gets across into the mucosa that would trigger something like this. I think that's, is this going to be a when that you get viremic or is it really going to be at mucosal surfaces? So mm. some, I, I, you know, we, of course I talked about the receptor driven process of dimeric IgA, but you will, some, when monomeric IgA is infused, some does end up in the mucosa. So mm-hmm. paracellular leakage, you know, uh, nonspecific transfer. So for sure it makes it, I, I don't have a number for you, but I, what I've read about IgA netosis and, and the pathologies associated with this, it seems to be that I think in individuals or in animals treated with DNAs, they had lower IgA induced netosis and higher rates of septicemia, um, septicemia right? Bacteria mm-hmm. in the blood. So, this could be a mechanism of protection against pat- pathogens in the blood that would cause um, septicemia. Yeah. And I think once you have tissue damage, then all bets are off about things that were in the blood or mm. leaking into. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. No, very true. Yeah. I was just wondering. The- uh, about the the envelope versus non envelope virus because mm-hmm. I think that there's some evidence with some broadly neutralizing antibodies that they're making contacts with the lipid bilayer, mm, right. um, mm. and that could influence that structure that we were talking about, right. um, and and be a part of that stalk versus head um, thing that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at least in the HIV field, some of those broadly neutralizing antibodies have to contact the lipid, and Great so point. is the lipid part of the contact here? They also ask if if uh, nets have uh, well nets have been shown to have uh, participate in rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune conditions. So they want to see if uh, an antibody from a patient with rheumatoid arthritis complexed with an antigen, which is commonly an autoantigen, which they use citrullinated citrullinated human fibrinogen, whether they cause netosis in their system, and it does. So IgA, fibrinogen immune complexes from rheumatoid arthritis patients 
stimulate nitosis, not IgG from the same sera. Healthy donors do not do it. So as someone said before, that these, these play some role in, in uh, autoimmune diseases as well. So it's not just virus antibodies, but other antibodies can do this as well. I guess that's the point there. Right. Uh, they, 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 they looked at salivary IgA to see if it would do this. And it doesn't. It doesn't potentiate netosis in this system. Um, they used um, uh, influenza virus again, as they did before. And the serum IgA from the same donor stimulates netosis, but not salivary IgA. And I guess that's because the secretory component is blocking the FC portion of the antibodies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's probably just the blocking of that, of that receptor. Now the experiment that I would have loved to see, mm. but you know, you can't really ask, I, I, this would probably be a big ask as a reviewer, a lot of money, but we're missing a th the third type of IgA antibody. And that's the dimer before it transcytoses to the mucosal space, mm -hmm. which has been shown um, by the Van Eggman group, as well as others, can mm. potentiate netosis and other effector functions just as well as IgG or more. And so what you would have to do if you wanted to get that from a person, like, you know, how are they collecting saliva and blood here? You would have to collect the cells and, it, you know, pull the cells into culture, um, make it express the dimer because it hasn't transcytosed and use that. Of course, there's also recombinant dimeric IgA antibodies they could have used. Um, but mm. I would have liked to seen that experiment because I think what I would hypothesize is that it does just a good a job or more because there's two anti, you know, two di a dimer. Yeah. Um, it, it would just be nice to see that kind of complete the story. And they so, work because it's associated with J-chain, but not secretory component, which kind of makes it rigid and stuck into the... Yeah. the, the, the So the PIGR, polymeric immunoglobulin receptor, or PIGR, I don't like to call it PIGR, people do, but I think it sounds <laughs> awkward and weird. Um, so it it physically blocks. There's actually a binding region on the on the secretory piece on the FC region of, of IgM and IgA. And so, yeah, it... it you can maybe get yeah. some effector functions, but it's very low. But with the dimer, it's just J chain, so no blockage. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, Cindy, are you talking? Uh, um, you 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 went mute, Cindy. We're missing. I went you. mute. No, now oh, you're, you're good. Back. No, no, I think she was just showing with her hands. Oh, uh -oh. I might have been blocking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were showing us the J chain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, they they then say. Does uh, netosis need actually FC alpha receptor or not? So they have an antibody against the FC alpha receptor, and they add that before they add the virus antibody complexes, again, IgG or IgA. And yes, indeed, if you block the FC alpha receptor one, you block netosis. So that's so that, good. That's good, right? That's all good. <laughs> Yep. Next experiment, they say toll-like receptor 8 has been shown to uh, push neutrophils to netosis in, in the context of this uh, uh, FC gamma, in, in the context of actually IgG binding to FC gamma receptors. So they want to know if that if you need TLR8 mm -hmm. for their IgA-mediated netosis. <clears throat> TLR8, TLR8 is a sensor for single-stranded RNA. And so they don't want to use influenza viruses uh, because they have RNA and they might tickle TLR8. So instead of influenza virus, they use polystyrene beads, <laughs> which of course are much bigger, I guess. But they coat them with uh, protein L, which is a protein that binds the kappa light chain of antibodies. And the FC is free. And then they can add antibodies to the protein L, which is on the beads, and add them to neutrophils and ask, do you get netosis? So there's no tickling of TLR8, right? And yep. But they still get netosis. But I don't know. I'm very unhappy with this experiment because TLR8 is still there, right? It might want yeah, it is. to get rid of it. Can't we get rid of it? Yeah, or, well. Is yeah, there an agonist or an antagonist can. that we could use? An antagonist, I guess. I don't we'll leave this think, to the innate TLR. Yeah. I don't think there. there's a good antagonist for TLR8. And of no. course, it's not really expressed to the surface, so you can't block it easily. And So you'd have to do a CRISPR knockout and then uh, okay. 
and assay. So and these are primary, primary peripheral blood cells. It's it's very hard. It's it's doable, but it's not a trivial experiment. Yeah, and, and you know, I I look at the data that they say about TLR eight being important, but I would then come back to well, there are other TLRs that could That's be yeah. acting yeah. there, yeah. and so yeah, yeah. This, I was I was getting the thinking about well, how would I do it if I wanted to. Um, say that no TLRs are important. And that again gets really complicated in the genetics pretty quickly. So you'd have um, to yeah. have an R01 where you <laughs> <laughs> create a CRISPR knockout, you know, well, library you, of all the TLRs. You had, you had CRISPR knockout, Mighty 88, and TRIF. Yeah, right, that's your yeah, downstream. Yeah. 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 If you can double knock those out in very quickly in primary cells, then you could assay. Mm-hmm. But neutrophils are, I don't, they're not right. easy to work with. They're not easy right. to purify. If you look at them sideways, they get activated. And so I, I think if you tried to like lentiviral CRISPR out something, I, I'm sure people have done it, but I don't think it's so easy. Yeah. yeah I, unhappy and activated. And yeah, I kind of feel like interpret. in some ways, if they had a control here where they showed me that these um, beads didn't turn on a TLR dependent response, then I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And maybe oh, yeah, so that's it, a whole nother problem because if yeah. people are not yeah. used to uh, treating cells and looking at TLRs, they probably have ligands in their right. media and things. So, so Brian, stuff. would you have asked for that experiment to, to confirm that the beads themselves did not? Because do we see that experiment? No. We don't. No, no. I mean, right. well, okay. They have protein L beads, but they define that as one. Right. <laughs> so if there is any netosis there, you wouldn't know it. They right. sort of define that as one and then compare everything to that. I see. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I, I'm good with this saying that maybe it's not TLR8 dependent, but they use this to say that netosis is independent of TLR signaling. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they don't. A little strong. <laughs> That's a little, strong. little stronger than I would do. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Um, this underscores why it would be nice to have a mouse where you could study it. You can't because of the absence of the IgA right. receptor, but you could knock out TLR8 or downstream things and get neutrophils from mice, and that would yep. address all that, right? Yep. Can't do it. Nope. All right, well, so... I mean, you'd have, to, you'd have to mate them to the transgenic... Yeah. Right. Because I'm... I'm human FC alpha. I, yeah, I know there was a... Um, yeah. Humanized FC alpha mouse, but maybe... I don't know. It's hard to get to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you could take that and then knock knock out a TLR. Yeah, breed it, breed it to the eight yeah, knockout or my yeah. mighty eighty eight double. I guess they don't want to do that or whatever. That's a lot of work. Yeah, maybe this is the you know you you convince the reviewers <laughs> that this is the you know your proof of concept study, and then that yes, we will for sure be studying that. Thank you for the suggestion. Well, it depends on their interest, right? They may not be terribly yeah. interested, but they just wanted to address it quickly. And okay, sure. fine. Um, they wanted to know if, uh, well, so neutrophils can phagocytose things. And so um, does the IgA immune com- virus complex stimulate phagocytosis? Well, they don't use virus again. They use their beads, their polystyrene mm-hmm. beads coated with protein L. They add the antibody uh, and then they let the neutroph- they incubate them with the neutrophils wash. Uh, and they, they can look at uptake because they have... Um, uh, what did they? They have right. fluorescent something. What is labeled? I don't even remember. Something's li- got fluorescent label on it, and the they can measure are, the, beads. the beads. Yeah, the beads. Are fluorescent. The beads. Yeah, yeah. The fluorescent L-coded beads. Right. Yep. Right, and so they look to see yeah. if those beads got phagocytosed. Yep. Uh, and they do. And IgG yep. beads do not. And then they say, "Well, let's let's fix." The the antibody uh, the immune yeah. complex is on a glass, so it's not floating around. Does that make a difference? Um, and it still it still gets phagocytosed. Uh, no, it still it still no, leads to netosis, even when it's not possible to have phagocytosis. So uh, oh, the IgG, netosis part, yeah, yeah, yeah. IgG um, yeah. gave them phagocytosis. IgA did not give them phagocytosis. Right. Um, but then when they made phagocytosis impossible by sticking the beads to a cover slip, um, it still the test yeah. was still possible. So uh, greater bead uptake for IgG opsonized beads compared to IgA, which actually inhibited phagocytosis relative to protein L-coated beads. Okay, and then on a cover slip, higher netosis when they were 
uh, incubated with immobilized IgA, right? So phagocytosis. I always have problems with those because yeah. even if you immobilize things onto glass, they can come off. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a tough experiment. Hmm. They conclude that you don't need phagocytosis for netosis stimulation. I guess, I guess that, Cindy, how do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, you know, <laughs> sure, mostly. Does it, does it really matter, I guess, is the question. If you've got viral, yeah. virus coated with the IgA and it can induce netosis, which is the whole goal of that is to capture viral particles outside of the cell, does it really matter whether the hmm. neutrophil takes up that virus that's bound to the IgA and F FC alpha or not. I, I right. don't know. Well, and I'm physiologically, not sure why this was such a big deal. Physiologically, you usually have both, and you usually right. have both IgG and IgA, yeah. and could have yeah. both. Yeah. Right. right, like right, right. in the yeah. system, exactly. you're going to have yeah. Right. So IgA can contribute by sticking them in one place, and Ig IgG can come and help They're with the phagocytosis. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now there are two kinds of. Netosis, as Cindy said earlier, there's yeah. suicidal yes. netosis, where the cell dies, and then there's vital netosis. Where I know I have to say, like Cindy said, I wasn't as up to date with my netosis literature, and so that was yeah. that that net nuance was uh, interesting to learn. Well, it turns out that I was actually so out of date on my netosis literature. I had learned that it wasn't clear if the cells died or not. No. Oh. <laughs> so you're like 10 years ago. <laughs> so then they died, but now they, they don't. Now it turns out I was right after all. Oh, you were right. <laughs> anyway, it's one, a good thing not to pay attention to yeah, stuff. Yeah, if you just while. wait 10 years, it'll circle back, right? Yeah. Anyway, the two, the two kinds have difference. They have some differences that they, they exploit. Uh, the suicidal requires reactive oxygen species production between one and three hours. Vital needs doesn't need it, and it happens five to 60 minutes. So they do a time course experiment, and they find that the, uh, the IgA, uh, influenza virus stimulated netosis, is cons consistent with suicidal netosis. And they show with an inhibitor of ROS, uh, they confirm that. So Okay, it's, it's suicidal. <laughs> now, the last experiment, which uh, is a virus experiment, d does the trapping of a virus particle by these nets, does it inactivate the viruses? Because that's what they do for bacteria. They trap the bacteria and then inactivate them. So then they, uh, in this experiment, they take their neutrophils, they either don't treat them or treat them with PMA to induce suicidal netosis. And then, so the, the, the neutrophils are throwing out these traps and then they throw virus in uh, and see if there's any infectivity left. They can actually see that the virus particles, which are fluorescently labeled, they're trapped in the nets, right? And you can quantify it. And then they ask, is the virus in there actually still infectious? So they have uh, they have a a neon reporter virus, okay, and uh, they they had they induced the netosis. They add the virus to the cells, and then they digest the nets with DNAs to release the virus that's inside, and uh, then they collect the culture media and they quantify uh, the infectious virus. They actually measure infectious virus. So there's a reduction <laughs> in, in the amount of virus uh, after. But I got to tell you, it's not much. It is, uh, it's the last figure in the paper. Percent infectivity, yeah. it goes from 100% to 50% in three hours and 25% in six hours. And I'm telling you, half of infectivity in the world of viruses is nothing. Right. I mean, you want at least yeah, a tenfold it's reduction. It's usually a log scale, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, this is not really convincing to me that they're mm, being sure. inactivated. Right. Right. Like well, when you put percent infectivity and not log fold change, yeah, absolutely. you get nervous. <laughs> absolutely. Got to be a log scale for sure. Otherwise you're dealing with pipetting error or, uh, yeah. you know, they're manipulating it in so much, you're going to lose some infective. Anyway, I'm not convinced that it's inactivating and, it, right? And they're using the PMA stimulation, which is like the hammer, right? I mean, yeah. that's yeah. massively activating the, the 
neutrophils and causing much more net formation than you get with the virus IgA immune complexes. Right. So I guess I just want to clarify that I'm understanding this figure correctly because I, I feel mm. like it was, you guys, the description here is a little different than what I was thinking about. So here they're showing that if they use DNAs and degrade the nets, the virus is still ineffective. So right. it's not that the virus somehow gets turned off when it's in the net. It's, it's only it's only trapped. If it somehow could get out of the trap, it's okay. That's what I thought. Too. That's what okay. I think. I don't think the reduction is any specific in, inactivation, which they right. think it okay. is. They think it's being inactivated in the net, but I don't think so. I think you'd have to do a lot more experiments and maybe well, I didn't, Yeah, that's not how I read it either. So you, so you, well, the right, DNA experiment is just to make sure that DNA itself doesn't inactivate infectivity, right? Right. Because the DNA well, is used to break the net open. Well, so it says that they that they stimulate the neutrophils first, right? So the, all the wells have nets. Then they degraded, um, or they yeah they degraded the uh, nets in some and not in others. Then they incubated with the virus, and then they collected the supernatant, so whatever wasn't bound. And so I think, Brianne, was your interpretation that if they treated with the DNAs, then none of the virus stuck down and that was available to infect the target cells, which was MDCK cells? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they say- the nets were there, they were trapped. So when you collected the supernatant, the viral particles were not there. Yeah, so they say, suggest, this suggests that physical contact with the net is required for inactivation and that soluble factors are not sufficient. And it's the inactivation part that I think yeah. that the inactivation is the wrong with. word. Yes. I, I don't think so. It's we're being actually inactivated. all, I think we're all on the same page. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like we yeah. worked around yeah, the Yeah, I think, I think so too. I think it's now, just inactivation okay. is just the wrong, yeah, yeah, wrong yeah. word. And also, you're, you're right. So the, the critique about this experiment is it's just not biologically. I mean, should I, could I go as far as to say it's not really biologically relevant? Yeah. Because there's a reason I think the body doesn't want the hammer throw of IgA netosis because of the, um, you know, the pathogenicity potential. Mm. And also the adding the virus. I mean, the virus is going to be there already. Right. At, at the time of this netosis. And so then adding it after is a little... Yeah. I think their question was, if you had nets there... Do they trap virus that is now not available? And I think that they prove that point. And, Couldn't and think, you do that though by adding the virus first? You could still prove that by having the virus first, then activating netosis, then doing DNAs and recovering. Yeah, you should have the virus first. I agree. Yeah. I, mean, I, would, I think but I think the other thing that they're trying to think about here is that maybe neutrophils that are undergoing netosis also make some other cytokine or make some yeah. other factor. And it's actually that other factor that's that's important here and not the physical net. Yeah. And this shows it's the physical net that's important, not some other magic thing that that's being true. made by that neutrophil yeah. at the same time. What, what yeah. do you mean the physical net is important for what? So, so it's so it's not as though the neutrophil made a cytokine or right. made some defensive interferon. or something, interferon, that is actually what's stopping infectivity. It is physically being trapped in the net. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so if, okay. if it's, it is, whether it's inactivated or not, it's not clear. But let's say in vivo, a, a net is trapping virus particles. What happens to them? It's just, I mean, where well, do they that, go? That, that's the next paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? Why is this? Presumably somebody comes along and cleans them up, right? Well, because that's the question, right? if you right. just trap them, they could just infect another cell. I guess right. they could get out of the trap. there's a lot of DNAs, right? So I don't know how stable nets are in vivo long-term. Um, because We probably don't want them very stable long-term. That would... Well, uh, that is but true. also, yeah, so they might fall apart and the virus particles get out if they're not inactivated. Or right. how... how um, dense... I mean, I could see that a bacterium could be retained in a net, but a virus might squeak out, right? Mm -hmm. So what we know mm -hmm. is that antibody, a viral antibody with a virus stimulates a net. We don't know what happens after that, right? It may well, have- Well, so let's not think of it as a fish net, right? So it's, you're not like scooping it up and it's like stuck in the suit, It's on the outside? Right? You think it's but on it's, the outside? No, no. I think there's like cables of nets that are coated with proteins that yeah. are sticky. And so those stick the viral particles. Okay. And so I don't think- 
at least my interpretation of it that would is be not good. that it's yeah. just the DNA is yeah. kind of going and sucking mm-hmm. it in. Okay, so I, the virus. No, that's not. That yeah. it's just virus, with so the virus the is virus. sequestered then. So yes. What's mm-hmm. the fate of neutrophils? Do they get taken into the liver and digested or something eventually? The neutrophils? Do you know? Uh, you mean corp- the neutrophil corpses are usually cleaned up by the macrophages in the tissue. Oh, so that's what could happen here, right? The max could yes. engulf the whole thing yep. with virus and that's it the could. end of the virus. Okay. Right. Yep. You, you could do that. You could look at that experimentally yep. though, yeah. right? And you yeah. could do- design some in vivo experiments with some knockout models to look at yeah. like, right, what happens with this. And then if you, what happens if you don't have IgG, do you have not, yep. no macrophage induction to clean it up? Yeah. And so, Brian, going okay. back to your point, just to, to wrap up this this figure. So, so I do see what you mean now is that the, the how they added this in allows you to just look at the nets, the phys, you know, and not some cytokine induced mm-hmm. effects. I, I gotcha. So they say in their discussion, these data demonstrate that nets can trap and inactivate viruses. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's correct. And then they say nets are decorated with antimicrobial proteins that are known to inactivate viral particles, including myeloproxidase, cationic peptides like defensins, right? So they're thinking these are, so you could actually test that. You could yes. take them one by one and see. You could. Hmm, cool. So mm. much fun stuff to do in the future. Wow. So I mean, they say, uh, me, this trapping, by <laughs> the way, they say doesn't happen in the mucosa because there's no, Monomeric IG. It's mostly happening in that's tissues, well, right? That's where I, that's and, where I started uh, asking that question. Yeah, I think there's some. I do think there's some, but, the, yeah. but there's, you know, the neutrophil influx is happening in the tissue, right? It's not, yeah. I mean, maybe you have some neutrophils yeah, coming into the, you know, into the lumen where your gut processes are, but I think tissue or vasculature probably. And they speculate that if you're if you have antibodies to the virus, either by, by recovery from an infection or vaccination, then maybe early on these interactions could participate, I would say, participate in uh, reducing viral load. I don't think it's working on its own, right? There are other things going on, but. Sure. Um, what you don't want to do is sniff PMA to make nets to get rid of viruses. <laughs> yes. No, no. Has pe- have people suggested doing no. that? No, 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 no. I have a lot of it in my lab. We use it most every day, though. So perhaps I could. So put a warning. No sniffing. No, no, no. Don't don't try to activate your neutrophils to get rid of viruses. So uh, what do we think overall? Is It's it's kind of interesting. Just just some things that need Mm -hmm. to be sorted out, right? Uh, Yeah, and that's always the case, right? Yeah, never, uh, I, I think that they, uh, we would have been okay if they didn't just state that one extra thing about inactivating it because I don't think they've shown that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I learned though a lot of I did. you know things to think about from this paper, um, I mean, and yes. it brought up some things I usually overlook. So I was really excited about all the things I learned. I yeah. agree. I did too. Yeah, and so within the uh, group, one of the groups I'm a part of is the Civics Influenza Large Vaccine Working Group, and we are exploratory looking at you know correlates of protection that are not. Fab dominated uh, f- effector functions of binding the virus, and and this is not something that th- anybody is looking at. And so actually, when you sent this paper, Vince, and I, I sent it to our the um, the leader of this this group, I said, "Hey, we should we should talk about this, and maybe maybe this is something I'll be doing." Hmm. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Has anyone ever done netosis in this group assays? Yeah. No. I've I've gone fishing. I know macrophages do it too, but <laughs> I've thrown nets out in the water. But <laughs> I I got as far as reading their methods to see whether I thought it was something I could do in my immunology lab. Oh, it's really tricky as far as I yeah. understand. I, yeah. I I explored potentially doing it once, and they were like, "Do you really need to know that?" Because it's, mm. it's really tough. Um, and to macro- macrophages do it too. A couple of other cell types also do it. So we have three emails. Want to get through them? Sure. Yeah. I think we can do that. Who wants to take the first one about an autoimmune disorder? Okay. So this is Alexander? Yes, please. So Alexander writes, Dear Immune Professors, this is Alexander from Seattle. Sorry for the many emails. I guess we ignored him for a while. Hopefully but your we your podcasts didn't. have really gotten me thinking and writing. I promise I'll stop filling your inbox soon. My question is as follows. If the hygiene hypothesis of autoimmune disorders turns out to be true, 
wouldn't that be bad news for long-term human habitation in space? The microbiome of a Mars colony is likely to be much smaller and less varied than on Earth. Wouldn't we expect future generations born on Mars or other space habitats to have massive autoimmune issues because of that? Assuming the hypothesis, the hygiene hypothesis is accurate. Your insights would be greatly appreciated. Sincerely, Alexander. Hi. Never thought about that. I think there's going to be a lot of problems potentially wow. with long-term space dwelling that... <laughs> Yeah. Have you ever In seen, is it, is it, uh, Wally? Is that the one where they're all like really huge, giant, yeah. floppy people at the end? Cause they haven't exercised or worked out or anything. Yeah. They're dependent on yeah. robots. Yeah. Yeah. So move them around and stuff. Yeah. No. Um, seriously though, I, I don't know. It's interesting. You know, this, this, habitation in space is going to have a lot of effects on so many different physiological processes, I think uh, by the time we have probiotics that you take if you're going into space. I think by the time we go to Mars, yeah, we'll have some kind of understanding of what you need. (laughs) Well, and I I also think that at least, you know, from my extensive research known as um, watching the movie The Martian, (laughs) um, (laughs) uh, there is a certain amount of that we're going to need in terms of bringing microbes to help with things like um, the soil and growing food and things like that. And so I think that the microbiology of colonizing another planet will actually be quite complex. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing to think about that's interesting is the, the majority of the changes in our gut microbiome happen within the first month of life. And so unless the babies are going to be born in space, you know, it, it, it seems to be more challenging to change people's, the permanent phyla that are in the microbiome once they have, yes. you know, grown up. So maybe it, you would have some perturbations. You'd have to take probiotics. So you don't like have diarrhea, but I, I don't know if you would see maybe, I don't know. We'll have to. You guys uh, have heard about paleo feces. Um, the idea being that, that oh, when we were hunter gatherers, we had a better microbiome. Oh right? yes, yes, yes. I have heard about and this. So Isn't there, there are, like some dude going around. Yeah, and, he's there's mm-hmm. a dude who. Uh, so there's a, a a series of people in uh, where are they Tasmania maybe who we think have as close as possible to you know paleo feces because they have a hunter gatherer diet. So this guy, yeah, he gave himself a fecal transplant from them and i think um the 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 science writer for the times i forgot her name she wrote an article about it gina gina colada gina colada i think this guy's nuts frankly but (laughs) and i if if i remember that article i spent a lot of time talking about all of the reasons why perhaps the idea of this group in tanzania being the ideal microbiome is a a little on the sketchy side. That's crazy. Uh, I mean, he gave himself an enema with a turkey baster full of poop from these guys. Can you imagine? I mean, what an idiot. Was that that IRB approved? Yeah, right. (laughs) No way. They they would never do that. He didn't even check to see if there are any parasites. there are viruses, parasites. And also maybe leave these people alone. Maybe you don't need to be, you know, bothered. Yeah, we should leave them alone. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's the same idea that we're our problems today are because we don't do the right things, right? So we're already screwed up. Yeah, and it maybe gets worse on Mars. <laughs> anyway. Well, cer- certainly um, the C-sections didn't help and antibiotic use didn't help. Those were two major impactors on yeah. our microbiome. Right? Um, Steph, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Hello, immunomodulators. Also, just to go back, I to so as Cindy said, agreed. But I think I do tend to try to um, talking about C sections because I think it does put some guilt on mothers mm-hmm. who have C sections. Oh, I know. So it's not to say that you're going to permanently damage your child by getting a C-section, but it is to say there are some differences in in, in, in uh, infants who were born vaginally or by C-section and by studying these things, and maybe we could give a probiotic to mm. infants right. to help that. So, Well, yeah. the, same, the same message with breastfeeding, right? Because that sure. also helps shape the yeah. microbiome. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, right. 
Okay, great. Jace writes, hello, immune modulators. I picked up on immune just a few months ago and have flown through the episodes. It has helped me through quarantine. As a critical care nurse practitioner, my science background was brief and superficial, but I had always found immunity fascinating and your podcast is very educational. It is confusing and disheartening to see certain patients become so critically ill from this viral infection, I'm assuming SARS-CoV-2, while others surprisingly appear unaffected. Your podcast has made me dive into the depths of PubMed. And I have a question. I think Cindy and Steph are going to like this one because it dives into innate immunity. I think she meant Cindy and Bran, but I'm <laughs> I'm happy to also get excited about innate immunity. Linked below is a uh, systematic review examining the role of NLRP3 inflammasome in obesity and insulin resistance. And there appears to be an association. Additionally, obesity and diabetes have been associated with vascular endothelial dysfunction in pro-inflammatory states. The cross-link between immunity and coagulation occurs via the NLRP3 inflammasome and tissue factor expression, as you guys covered a few episodes back. My question is, could there be a way to obtain a biomarker profile that could help differentiate which patients have increased expression of NLRP3? I imagine this would be difficult as it is cytosolic protein complex, correct? And there's a PubMed. Thanks for all you do in science communication, warm regards. Yes, it is very difficult to have biomarkers of anything, um, let alone a cytosolic protein complex. Um, I know that that Kate Fitzgerald has some nice work on um, the inflammasome and SARS-CoV-2, and she's mm -hmm. done some work with an inhibitor as well. I think it's a sting inhibitor. It's a sting inhibitor. No, it's actually a sting oh. activator. Oh, sting activator. You're right. Yeah, it's a You're sting right activator. To induce interferon. And mm -hmm. she's she's talked about that a couple mm -hmm. of times. So does does this play a role? And does it play a role in the coagulation? I don't know. Probably. Um, maybe what one could do is if there are SNPs associated with it or something, mm -hmm. you could look for those, which wouldn't require sampling to to determine protein expression or whatever. Yeah, that's yeah, what I was thinking too. Sure was about looking at transcripts or looking at, at SNPs first. And then maybe after that, you can start looking at proteins, but that would be mm. a bit complicated. I mean, you could look at their ability to produce IL-1 via inflammasome activation in vitro and see if it's higher or lower. But And maybe yeah. the future of biomarkers for disease is not one protein complex mm -hmm. or one thing. I envision you would have SNPs or you would have some profile that you would have at your doctor and you would be in a, in a risk category. So mm -hmm. do, do you produce low or high amounts of interferon upon stimulation? Do you have an LRP3 activation? And, and maybe that would allow for the nuance. And you would imagine that the population of people that would have high risk, low innate immunity would be the elderly or, you know, so maybe that's the future of, of that. And Brianne, can you take that last one? Sure. Also writes, hi, Brianne, Steph, Cindy, and Vincent. Thanks for the last immune. Loved your discussion about complement, coagulation, and the Kali Crean system. I know many found these systems difficult to understand. However, I guess it is like everything. You learn what you work with. <laughs> I can just say that I find all the immune cells and how they differentiate in response to their environment, like cytokines and stuff, really difficult to keep in order, while the complement system feels like home. <laughs> I think you should invite a compliment expert for an episode asking all you want to know and how compliment is the thing in immunology. <laughs> Two excellent U.S.-based researchers are Claudia Kemper at NIH and John Lambris at University of Pennsylvania. All the best, Elsa, and she's from Sweden. Do you think she's pushing for us to do more compliment episodes? Mm, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> do, does anybody know one of those two individuals? Not personally. I do not know. Do you do you but know sure of either one? Do you know of their work? Their their compliment yes. experts? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, try and get Heard Claudia right to her and see. Uh, Sounds great. See if she wants to do it. All right. That'd be fun. All right. That's that's immune number forty seven. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash immune. Uh, send us your questions and comments. Immune at microbe.tv. And Alexander, don't worry about sending too many questions. Keep them coming. We love questions. questions. We live for Absolutely. questions. <laughs> and if you really like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle's at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Thanks. This is fun. 
And Brian Barker's at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm looking at these handles, you know. <laughs> I, I just heard a story of a guy who had a very cool Instagram handle. And you, do you know there's this website where people steal them and sell them? They hack into I've your heard phone. Of that. It's called Original Gangster Something. God, it's horrible. Anyway, oh, this gosh. guy was harassed until he gave up his Instagram. You know what one of the things they did? They kept delivering like three, four orders of pizza a day to his house. Oh, he that's would, cool. That's bizarre. And he would have to send them away. And he and the guy said, if you if you don't give me the handle, I'm gonna keep doing it. And it just happened for days and days. And he and his wife said, We can't handle this anymore. Can you imagine? <laughs> No. Oh, that's wild. I'm I would, so confused. I'm so confused. I would call the pizza company and redirect the address to a homeless shelter or somewhere yeah. that could use pizza and don't let the troll know and then just be like, yeah, sure. Like, keep on. But that's crazy. It's ridiculous. I mean, they were a different company. Time. They were a different place. And then they found his oh. parents' address in a different state and started sending them. What? I mean, what people are going to do. Amazing. But he gave up. He can't be responsible for it because they didn't actually order the pizza. No, he wasn't. He sent them away. He said there was no problem to send them away, but it's just a, you know, they're in bed at midnight and the door rings. (gasps) I mean, can you imagine? I'd I'd freak out. I really would. Yeah, I'd freak out too. Anyway, the, the, if you, I'm, I'm glad I don't have a good handle at all. I'm Prof VR and everything. And you can find me at virology.ws. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.